Hey everyone, um, welcome to the Health of the World uh, International Grand Rounds. Um, and uh, we have um, uh, our esteemed uh, speaker today, a close friend, Dr. Marina Bassina, who is a uh, faculty at Stanford Medicine, a clinical professor in endocrinology and covering an important topic. Um, and she is uh, an expert and has received numerous, numerous teaching awards and clinical care awards. And I would really trust my family in her hands. So uh, she, uh, the fact that she's taking our time uh, for us is, is, is we're really grateful. So uh, thank you, Marina. And um, I hope it's a great session. I will um, uh, hand off to Pranati, our lead uh, coordinator. And um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Barija. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining for another International Grand Rounds this week. Today, we'll be discussing the very important topic of DKA and HHS. Leading our conversation will be Dr. Marina Bassina, who is a renowned endocrinologist from Stanford University School of Medicine. After completing her medical education at Moscow School of Medicine, she completed her internship and residency at the University of California, Los Angeles, and then completed a fellowship at Stanford University. With over two decades of experience in the field of diabetes research and clinical care, Dr. Bessina is recognized as an expert in her field. Her research focuses on improving the management of diabetes and developing new therapies for the disease. She has published numerous papers on, in top medical journals on the topic and has been invited to speak at both national and international conferences. Dr. Bessina is actively involved in educating the next generation of physicians and researchers in the field of endocrinology. Her dedication to advancing the understanding and treatment of diabetes has gotten, gotten her recognition all over the world. So we are so thrilled to have you today, Dr. Bessina. And uh, with that, I will hand the mic off to you. Thank you very much for a great introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna share my slides. Are you able to see the slides? Okay, great. Okay, yes. excellent. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to give a talk. Um, this is a, an important topic. We are trying as much as we can to prevent hospitalizations for uh, diabetes ketoacidosis and um, hyperglycemic emergencies. But unfortunately, we do have them more and more. And um, I think it's all over the world that trend that um, DKA um, frequency of DKA admissions and HHS admissions are actually going up, uh, whether that's COVID related or something else related or a cost of insulin. Um, it's difficult to say, but we're definitely seeing an increase um, everywhere. Um, so what are those two conditions? Um, the diabetes ketoacidosis and non-ketotic hyperglycemia or, um, um, or a hyper small or hyperglycemic state, a different terminology for basically the same condition. Those two are life-threatening uh, acute metabolic complications of diabetes. The annual average incidence is about 100,000 uh, hospitalizations for DKA in the United States. And an average cost was 13,000 about 10 years ago, but now the cost uh, quadrupled. It's a part of the continuum of hyperglycemia with or without accumulation of the keto acids. Both conditions can occur in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. 2 to 8% of all diabetes hospital admissions are for the treatment of ketoacidosis. And again, it increases by 30% in the past decades and uh, in the past few years since COVID, we're seeing even more increase. Annual incidence is about five to eight episodes per thousand patients. And again, it's appeared to be on the rise. Mortality rate uh, are pretty low for uh, DKA, um, less than 5%, but still remain significant around 15% for non-ketotic hyperglycemia. 
prognosis of both conditions worse with extreme of ages and presence of coma or severe hypertension. Uh, diabetes ketoacidosis can be an initial presentation in about 50 to 20% of adults with diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes, and uh, overall 30 to 40% of patients uh, with type 1 diabetes. There are numerous precipitating factors that um, can lead to um, any of those two, to the either DKA or non-ketotic hyperglycemia. Infection is being really common, any type of infection, pneumonia, urinary tract infection, or, um, a, or the COVID infection, any severe viral infection. Um, I don't know whether you, in um, your places it's the same, but we're seeing uh, a lot of hospital, more increase in hospitalizations for respiratory sensitive virus, uh, RSV, uh, more severe cases than in the past alcohol abuse, a drug abuse, silent myocardial infarction is a common um, cause. So if you're seeing a patient with DKA or non-ketotic hyperglycemia, those patients may not have uh, chest pain as a manifestation of myocardial infarction. So that's why it's silent. So still suspected an electrocardiogram would be one of the um, the important uh, diagnostic workup um, tests. Stroke, pancreatitis, trauma, medications such as steroids is the most common one. Hot weather um, and insulin just going bad with the hot weather, insufficient water intake in elderly patients with non-ketotic hyperglycemia, so getting dehydrated on top of having very high blood sugars. Non-compliance with the insulin therapy that primarily happens in patients with type 1 diabetes. Um, so there are three main components um, in uh, both conditions. It's hyperglycemia. Acidosis is more in the DKA, although mild acidosis can be present in non-ketotic hyperglycemia, and ketosis is in DKA. Precipitating events. Uh, triggers uh, with uh, and along with the decrease in the insulin production or decrease in the insulin availability, increase in the glucagon and counter-regulatory hormones uh, leads to lipolysis, also protein catabolism or degradation of protein, both lipolysis and protein degradation provides the substrate to the liver for the new glucose formation that contributes to hyperglycemia. Also, because of the decrease of the insulin, because of the increase of the contraregulatory hormone, there is a state of in insulin resistance and decreased glucose uptake. So both contribute to significant hyperglycemia, osmotic diuresis, accumulation of the free fatty acids from lipolysis, leads to ketogenesis, ketonemia, ketonuria, and acidosis. Uh, DKA is a pro-inflammatory state. Severe hyperglycemia triggers macrophage production of different cytokines, such as TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-1, and CRP. On top of decrease in insulin secretion and increase in the insulin resistance, Increase in fatty, free fatty acids more, so it's like a snowball creates more insulin resistance. There is impairment nitric oxide production and um, worsening of the endothelial dysfunction. So what are the distinction between DKA and non-ketotic hyperglycemia or non-KH? And this term um, kind of changes every few years. Again, the most recent one is not HHS, but more uh, non-ketotic hyperglycemia. Uh, with DKA, there is more severe insulin deficiency that leads to ketoacidosis. Comparing to non-ketotic hyperglycemia, there is also an insulin deficiency, but moderate. There is still sufficient amount of insulin produced to block lipolysis because only about 10% concentration of insulin is required to suppress lipolysis comparing to how much insulin needed to, for glucose utilization and to bring glucose into the cells. 
In GKA, there's higher concentration of free fatty acids, lower concentration of insulin versus um, non-ketotic hyperglycemia, lower concentration of free fatty acids and higher concentration of um, insulin present. Uh, clinical presentation, uh, very similar, polyuria, polydipsia in both conditions, as well as weakness, weight loss. In DKA, because of the ketosis, there is more nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Uh, for signs uh, on of the hypothermia in, present in both conditions, tachycardia also in both conditions, tachypnea more in DKA, and Kussmaul breathing is typical for DKA. Ileus can be present in ketoacidosis, acetone breast and alto consortium, uh, sensorium can be in both. Uh, for presentation, usually DK presents with acute onset that develops over hours to days, and it's more common in type 1 diabetes than in type 2 diabetes. With non-ketotic hyperglycemia or hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, there's onset more insidious, develops over days to weeks, more present in older age and more common in type 2 diabetes than type 1 diabetes. Neurological symptoms uh, present can present in both conditions and um, the degree vary depending on the duration of hyperglycemia and how high plasma osmolality is. Usually develop with plasma osmolality over 320 to 330 milliosmol per kilogram. For DKA, abdominal pain is more common with, than with non-ketotic hyperglycemia, and actually 46% of patients can present with abdominal pain. It is associated with severity of the ketosis. On physical exam, we usually see the signs and symptoms of decreased skin trigger, dry oral mucosa, low jugular venous pressure, and hypotension. Specifically for DKA, uh, it will be more the fruity odor uh, due to exhaled ketones, or basically it's acetone, deep respiration, which called Kussmaul respiration. 25% patients can have coffee ground emesis and uh, could be GWAC positive stool, which is due to hemorrhagic gastritis. So those patients do not need to have an endoscopy. It's usually resolved we results with the resolution of DKA. Mental status can vary from full alertness to lethargy and coma. For temperature could be either normothermia or hypothermia, and it's due to peripheral vasodilation. Hypothermia, as I mentioned, is a poor prognostic sign. For initial laboratory evaluation, um, Plasma glucose, BUN creatinine, serum ketones, and electrolytes need to be checked. Um, calculated anion gap, our laboratory nicely provides us with the number, so we don't have to do the um, calculation. But the formula, if you don't have it uh, provided by the laboratory, it would be sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate um, and also um, serum osmolality. Your analysis throughout out UTI as a precipitating factor, urinary ketones, arterial blood gas, CBC with differential throughout out the infection, as I, we talked before, electrocardiogram is an essential test, bacterial cultures um, of blood and urine. Hemoglobin A1C is a very good test to get done to determine the duration of the hyperglycemia because somebody who may have quite low hemoglobin A1C, then you would suspect um, that this patient has very recent onset of diabetes, um, unless patient has severe anemia or kidney disease or liver disease where A1C would not be accurate and chest X-ray as indicated. Laboratory criteria of ketoacidosis versus non-ketotic hyperglycemia. Blood sugars usually higher in non-ketotic hyperglycemia, 
can be over 600 um, and they're less and um, so hyperglycemic in um, diabetes ketoacidosis. Um, my, I think um, the highest level of the glucose that I've seen in patients with non-ketotic hyperglycemia was um, 1600. Arterial pH uh, will be less than 7.3 in DKA and usually over 7.3 in non-ketotic hyperglycemia. Bicarbonate would be lower in DKA and over 20 in non-ketotic hyperglycemia. BUN is higher in non-ketotic hyperglycemia because of the higher blood sugar and higher degree of dehydration. Osmolality lower in uh, DKA and I guess because of the degree of hyperglycemia higher in non-ketotic hyperglycemia, high urine ketones in DKA as well as the serum ketones and negative or small amount of ketones can be present in non-ketotic hyperglycemia. And anion gap would be significantly elevated in uh, non uh, in DKA and will be mildly elevated, but usually less than 12 in non-ketotic hyperglycemia. Um, there is such a definition as mild to moderate DKA, which is defined for bicarbonate between 10 and 18 and pH over 7.3. In our hospital, if patient is in mild DKA by this definition, uh, we don't need to admit the patient to um, intensive care unit. Patient can go to subacute units. Um, other laboratory measurements, uh, plasma sodium, usually low due to elevated plasma osmolality and the degree of hyperglycemia. Uh, we can calculate corrected sodium, uh, correct a level for the glucose. The way we do it is we add 1.6 mil equivalent of sodium per each 100 milligram per deciliter uh, plasma glucose over 100 um, to the measured glucose. For potassium, there's usually whole body potassium deficit, and it could be as much as three to five milligrams per kilogram per of weight. It's due to serum pot urinary potassium losses and also due to high serum osmolality and, and insulin deficiency. There is a translocation of potassium out of the cell. So even if potassium could be low normal or normal in the blood, there is still severe body potassium deficiency. Uh, for uh, plasma phosphate, um, due to phosphaturia and metabolic acidosis, there is a negative phosphate, phosphate balance and phosphate not uncommonly would be quite low. So what are our goals for therapy? Correction of dehydration, hyperglycemia, and electrolyte imbalance, um, the very important ones. It's also really important to identify the precipitating events and counsel patient um, on uh, why did the person go into ketoacidosis? How can we prevent that from happening in future? Frequent monitoring. And our nurses are our best friends in management of TKA because they're at the bedside and they play a very key role in monitoring and early recognition of diabetes complications. Um, again, care of uh, for TKA is very um, labor, um, kind of stressful and consuming. Usually uh, patients require lots and lots of uh, care, sometimes one-to-one -one nursing care. Um, and it's important to maintaining fluid and electrolyte balance, administer intravenous fluids, electrolytes per the orders. If you have order sets, measuring intake and urine output, monitor serine electrolytes, vital signs for signs of dehydration or overhydration. Um, and the signs for dehydration would be tachycardia and orthostatic hypotension. Um, average fluid loss is about three to six liters with ketoacidosis and way more so in non-ketotic hyperglycemia could be up to 10 liters. Um, if you don't have the order sets uh, for DKA or HHS, um, start with 
normal saline, um, either 15 to 20 milligram per kilogram per hour, or give the first hour the bolus of one to one and a half liters. Then make your decision based on the sodium level. If the sodium level is high or normal, you can switch to half normal solution and continue the infusion with um, half normal saline, five to 15 milligram per kilogram per hour. If sodium level is low, then remain on the saline solution and again, continue with the same rate, five to 15 milligram per kilogram per hour. Now, it's important to know when glucose reaches less than 250 milligram per deciliter, add dextrose to the fluid and um, go with the rate approximately 150 to 250 milligram, uh, milliliters per hour with adequate insulin infusion. The goal for DKA to keep the blood sugar target between 150 and 200 until metabolic control is achieved. What that means is that we do need to give the insulin and glucose at the same time in order to allow for more insulin infusion for to wait for the anion gap to close. Because if we don't give extra glucose, then the blood sugars will start dropping fast with our great measures with hydration and insulin. And blood sugar will go low before the gap closes and we won't be, we will have to, for, we will be forced to stop the insulin infusion. So again, this point of adding the dextrose to the fluid when glucose gets below 250 is a very important one. Um, as for the insulin therapy, um, give 10 to 15 units of regular insulin as IV bolus. And again, if you don't have uh, dosing tables for the order sets or insulin calculators in our hospital, we have uh, pre-programmed um, insulin calculator for DKA, which nurses have been using successfully over the past few years. Um, but if you don't have that, um, give 0.1 unit per kilogram per hour with IV infusion, approximately would be about 47 units per hour. We expect serum glucose to fall by 50 to 70 milligram per deciliter in the first hour and then continues to fall. So if you don't see glucose fall um, by that amount, um, then double the insulin infusion, again, if you don't have the order sets. And uh, just to emphasize again, when blood glucose gets to below 250, add the dextrose solution. And we discussed the reason for that. For electrolyte replacement, uh, potassium is uh, a very important electrolyte to replace, as we discussed. So if potassium level is less than 3.3 milliequivalents per liter, then hold insulin infusion. And we do get a lot of questions. Why are we holding insulin infusion if blood glucose is high? Because when we give insulin and um, we push potassium into the cell, we can precipitate severe hypokalemia because body is so deficient in potassium and that can precipitate severe arrhythmia. So this is very, very important to hold potassium, to hold the insulin infusion. And you are still treating patients, you are still giving fluids, you're still replacing electrolytes. So patients still improving in their um, overall state, but we are holding on the insulin until potassium is replaced. If potassium is between 3.3, but less than five, give 20 to 30 milliequivalents of potassium replacement in each liter of IV fluids. Again, because we are getting potassium more into the cells uh, or repleting total body potassium losses. And if potassium is initial high or less than five, um, hold it, but uh, check potassium level every two hours. There is no need for bicarbonate infusion. If pH is over seven, insulin blocks the lipolysis and resolves ketoacidosis. So by, uh, the bicarb and pH will come up. Phosphate, no need to replace if less than one milligram per deciliter because it will self-correct with your treatment. But if less than one milligram per deciliter, then you can replace by giving 20 to 30 milliequivalents of K-phosph uh, to the replacement fluids. 
Monitoring uh, plasma glucose usually checked every hour. Electrolytes, uh, the pH can be done as venous pH, so we don't have to torture the patient with uh, arterial blood gas, gas each time. So um, the venous pH is recommended to check every two to four hours. And venous pH is pretty uh, close to the arterial pH. It's about 0 0.03 units lower than uh, pH in the artery. Follow anion gap to monitor resolution of acidosis because urine and blood ketones may persist for over 36 hours. So once we determine that ketones are positive, we don't follow ketone levels anymore, but we do follow the anion gap. So criteria for DKA resolution would be glucose less than 200 and stable, bicarbonate over 18, venous pH over 7.3, and normalization of anion gap. When we decide that all those uh, parameters are met and we're ready to switch from sub -Q insulin IV to sub-Q insulin, we always need to remember to give sub-Q insulin before turning off the insulin infusion. And the timing, how far um, in advance before stopping the infusion, that would depend on what type of insulin we're switching the patient to. Um, so this is just a um, sort of summary diagram, and I won't go into very uh, detailed of this because we just discussed everything. Um, but what I wanted to emphasize is that uh, don't rush to take patients off the drip because we're seeing frequently that patient had been in the drip for six to eight hours. Uh, the drip had been discontinued and switched to sub-Q and patient flips right back into DKA. So the average resolution time for DKA is 10 to 18 hours and sometimes can take up to 24 hours. So it's okay to continue the drip a little bit longer until usually we say you see at least two um, normal anion gaps two to three hours apart to, uh, from the blood test. And for HHS or non-ketotic hyperglycemia resolution can take nine to 11 hours. But again, the patient that I mentioned who had uh, blood glucose of 1600, it actually took over two days for um, resolution of the HHS. Um, how do we switch to sub-Q insulin? Um, always good to make changes in the morning, um, not at midnight and overnight. Um, you can use IV infusion over the past 24 hours as a total daily dose of the insulin. But because of the, um, the initial presentation, patient required more insulin because of the um, severe hyperglycemia, use the last three to four hours of this rate infusion if stable and um, multiply or over or extrapolate that to 24 hours. If meal planned, um, then give Lispro or Aspard um, insulin 10 to 15 minutes before the meal and before stopping the drip. Uh, you can turn off the drip after subcutaneous short-acting insulin is administered. If regular insulin is used for, as a short-acting that gives sub-Q injection 30 minutes before discontinuation of IV infusion. For the long-acting insulin, um, give MPH one to two hours before drip this stuff. And if you're giving glargine or any other flat or P plus long-acting insulin analogs, um, give two hours before stopping the drip. If patient is not previously on insulin, if this is a new onset of hyperglycemia, then consider scheduling subcutaneous insulin infusion um, in patients who had no, no prior history of diabetes or ketoacidosis, but requiring more than two units per hour. Um, so just in some examples, how do we calculate subcutaneous uh, dose? So we... Um, calculate the drip, as I mentioned. Um, so we allocate 80 to 100% um, to the um, insulin requirements. You can reduce by 20 to 25% if you are um, using total daily dose based on the um, 
severe hyperglycemia with patient admission because with resolution of hyperglycemia, glucose toxicity goes down and insulin requirements go down as well. Allocate 50% of that total calculated do, 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 uh, daily dose as a long acting or intermediate acting insulin, glargine or MPH, and the rest divide by the meal boluses between three meal or injections. Correction dose uh, also should be included for treatment of hyperglycemia added to meal boluses as needed. From 2012, the recommendations were included um, in ADA and still emphasize now that, um, again, adding scheduled insulin for prandial insulin doses for patients with no prior history of diabetes if blood glucose for preprandial remain over 140 and persistently requiring uh, correction of uh, blood sugar within 12 to 24 hours after discontinuation of the insulin. So which what that means if um, you stop the insulin, added the basal insulin, and you're not sure how much patient is going to eat, or if patient is going to require fixed prandial dose of insulin, you can use the scale. But if you can see that pre-meal dose, blood sugar is persistently over 100 and requiring corrective dose, then um, give pre-prandial dose along with corrective scale as needed, not just the scale. Um, so here's the case example. So you have a 59-year-old female with history of diabetes over 30 years who was treated with multiple daily injections, was sent to the emergency room from the clinic for confusion, lethargy, blood glucose of 945 on metabolic gap, on metabolic panel. She has no gap uh, on the blood test, bicarbonate 30, sodium 118, and potassium 3.5. On the exam, um, she's thin appearing, body mass index is 17. There are calluses on the knuckles, poor dentition, non-healing uh, dental implants. What is the probable diagnosis? What are the factors that may have led to this condition and could this have been prevented? Um, I think it's probably easier that I will try to answer this question. So this is actually a case from my clinic uh, patient who has type 1 diabetes. Uh, she, um, her gap was normal um, and she was, uh, bicarb was normal because she was so severely dehydrated. So the key in this case is that uh, tells us that how thin this patient is, that she has this poor dentition, um, knuckle, uh, knuckles with a calluses. So this patient actually has type 1 diabetes, but um, she has this condition that we call diabulimia. So when patients um, have induced vomiting, um, plus they don't take their insulin for the glucose um, to be kind of pouring in the urine and uh, the <clears throat> calories to be um, kind of going into the toilet with this um, glycosuria, um, so patient would not get, gain weight. What factors can lead to this condition? Again, any degree of dehydration, skipping the insulin dose or concurrent infection. How, how could this be prevented? This is a really difficult situation for patients. I don't know if you've seen those patients, but very difficult to deal with, um, very difficult to manage. So we may try to manage as a multidisciplinary team with diabetes educators, with nutrition and psychologists are essential part. For a specific situation for the hospitals uh, when patients are getting glucocorticoid therapy. So we do see those patients with um, COVID infection, especially if they come in with DKA, very high blood sugars. But on top of that, uh, we do, um, I see that I'm not a specialist in treated with COVID, but I can see that less of the decadron being administered than used to be in the beginning uh, of the pandemic. But if administered on top of the severe hyperglycemia, uh, DKA can be precipitated. Um, steroids will stimulate gluconeogenesis um, in the liver and also worsen the insulin resistance, decrease insulin secretion, mainly causes more postprandial hyperglycemia. 
So it's best to use IV insulin. And if we see patient with hyperglycemia, non-ketotic hyperglycemia, obviously we use more insulin uh, or I intravenously. Now, the important point is for those patients, um, if we if pay, uh, the, uh, if the team continues um, steroids after we decay resolved or non-ketotic hyperglycemia resolved, um, because it's primarily postprandial hyperglycemia, <clears throat> the distribution of basal prandial dose is more 30 to 40 percent allocated to the basal dose and 60 to 70 percent to the prandial dose. So different from our 50-50% that I discussed previously. And pH is a very good choice uh, because it's opposing to the peaks of steroids um, absorption. And proactively anticipate reduction of insulin as the steroids being tapered. Um, if patient is sick, um, especially with different um, pneumonias and aspiration, um, when enteral feedings or two feedings are used, uh, patients usually uh, receive those high carb content in most of the formulas. So you would dose as a fixed dose every six hours if the tubes feeds are continuous. And you can use one unit per every 10 to 15 grams of the carb amount in the um in the amount of the two feeds administered. For TPN, uh, very frequent uh, hyperglycemia in 77% of patients. Again, add the insulin into TPN bag, uh, but dose it based on the grams of carbs per bag and daily adjustment is needed. 2020, um, our guidelines added and still emphasize in most recent guidelines that A1C should be performed in all patients with diabetes or hyperglycemia who are admitted to the hospital if has not been done within the past three months. Basal insulin plus um, it alone or basal plus bolus correction um, an insulin regimen is preferred uh, for patients who are um, non-critically non -critically ill with poor intake or who are taking nothing by mouth. Insulin regimen, important to use all the um, components, which is basal, nutritional, or prandial, and corrective components, um, not as just corrective scale um, because it's um, a retrospective uh, reaction to hyperglycemia and sole use of sliding scales for inpatient hospital settings strongly discouraged. Uh, there should be a structured discharge plan tailored to individual patient with diabetes and patients should be receiving diabetes teaching. Uh, how do we decide uh, for patients who are admitted to the hospital uh, for um, various procedures in order not to induce decay as uh, our um, recommendation to the patients who are admitted uh, for various procedures. So in order not to hold insulin. So that is my point here is that it is important uh, to tell, not to tell patients not to stop all the insulins, which we are still seeing that happening and patients actually come in for their procedures with severe hyperglycemia requiring IV insulin drip. Um, so for patients who um, are on NPH and regular before coming into the hospital, tell patients not to stop insulin, but take two thirds of their PM dose for NPH insulin and two thirds of their PM dose of regular insulin. In the morning, do not give regular, but give still half of the dose of NPH. Patients are usually stressed before the procedure. So there is a stress hyperglycemia. Um, so don't stop all the insulins. And immediately post-stop, just give regular insulin as needed or uh, start IV infusion. If patients are on Glargine plus Humalog or Novolog or Lisper and Aspart, give two thirds of the glargine at bedtime or and 100% um, of the humalog or novolog with the dinner meal the night before. 
on the morning of surgery, you already have that two thirds dose of the glargine from night before because it's a 24 hour insulin. So hold all the insulin. For insulin pump patients, uh, we tell patients most important not to stop the insulin, um, not to disconnect from the pump, but actually they can reduce the basal rate by uh, 30% or to 70% and um, continue their basal rates until um, during surgery or give uh, or start with IV insulin infusion, or if pump is disconnected, then give glargine or give some sort of long acting insulin. What I wanted to mention uh, also the new sort of entity that we are seeing more often, and I'm sure you're seeing also, which is the euglycemic or normoglycemic diabetes ketoacidosis. Um, I couldn't um, talk about the DKA uh, lecture without mentioning this condition again, because we're seeing this more. And why are we seeing this more? It's because of the very widely used class of drug, um, sodium glucose transporter two inhibitors. So the mechanism of action of this drug is, um, blocking the reabsorption of the glucose in the proximal tubule of the kidney, where 90% of the glucose reabsorption uh, usually occurs. By blocking the, um, those SGLT2 transporters, glucose goes into the urine. So we're seeing increased glucose excretion and uh, removing the glucose from the body by insulin independent uh, pathway. Because of that, uh, blood glucose usually less than 200. Um, it can occur in both type one and type two diabetes. So other conditions, we'll talk about more about SGLT2 specific DKA, but nor euglycemic or normoglycemic DKA also can happen in pregnancy also can be in prolonged starvation, alcohol use, and partially treated insulin patients. Uh, what is the mechanism? So again, there is a uh, increase of the glucose excretion through the urine, insulin independent. Insulin levels are not stimulated, usually going down or patient uh, decreases insulin uh, administration because of the lower glucose. There is increase of the glucagon level, increase of the lipolysis, free fatty acid production, and all the similar mechanism as we discussed. The one difference is that um, there is more of the beta oxidation of free fatty acids and more of the beta hydroxylase um, of, of, of production than acetone, than acetoacetone. Um, so what is the key differences in the features between typical DKA and SGLT2-associated DKA? So again, serum glucose would be elevated in DKA and normal to mildly elevated in, serum, in um, SGLT2. Potassium level would be um, low to normal in most cases in um, SGLT2-associated um, DKA and um, there will be increased to low normal in severe cases in diabetes ketoacidosis. pH actually would be way lower in SGLT2 associated ketosis as well as bicarbonate. Um, so patients um, with type one diabetes are more prone um, to um, DKA associated with SGLT2. Um, because of the off-label use and because of the uh, frequency, American Diabetes Association came up with a card um, that patients should uh, be encouraged to carry with them and uh, if they are on the SGLT2 inhibitor. And uh, this card will have also STITCH protocol, which stands for ST for stop SGLT2 inhibitor, I for inject bolus of insulin, um, C for consume 30 grams of carbohydrates and H is for hydrate. Recheck ketones every three to four hours. Seek emergency medical care if ketosis does not resolve or if symptoms of ketoacidosis appear such as abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and um, fatigue, severe fatigue and dyspnea. How do we manage those patients? 
we suspect blood glucose um, when glucose is normal and patients are treated with SGLT2 in the setting of acute illness. Again, hold the medication is very important. It's important to emphasize to the patient that they need to hold their SGLT2 if they're sick or if they are preparing for surgery or if they're doing prolonged fast. Now we have a start of the Ramadan fast coming soon. Um, so we recommend our patients not to take SGLT2 because they're not able to drink for the water the whole day. Um, and also very be very careful or stop with the very low carb or, or um, um, ketogenic diets. Start infusion when with a treatment at low rate of the insulin, 0.05 unit per insulin per kilo. If patients have normal blood glucose, give um, add the dextrose to the AV fluids. And uh, patients with non anion gap hyperchloremic acidosis uh, recovery. May, so, this re recovery with uh, can occur with. Um, hyperchloremic acidosis, um, and it's usually resolved within 24 to 48 hours, and monitor bicarb and electrolytes. Um, I wanted to briefly mention, I couldn't talk about hyperglycemia with uh, states without mentioning treatment of hypoglycemia, which is also one of the may, um, important uh, diabetes emergencies. So it's defined as um, glucose of less than 70 or um, treatments needed for a severe hyperglycemia less than 50 or less than 54 by uh, most of the um, guidelines. What are the symptoms? Usually the first symptoms would be activation of sympathetic adrenal system, uh, causing sweating, anxiety, tremulousness, nausea, palpitations, and hunger. Neuroglycopenic symptoms come with fatigue, dizziness, headache, drowsiness, visual changes, inability to concentrate, abnormal behavior, loss of memory, confusion, severe loss of consciousness, and seizures. Suspect when capillary blood glucose is low, but confirmed by laboratory testing. Um, Home and hospital glucometers may have poor precision with blood glucose less than 60, so confirm with uh, meters. Um, if your patient is wearing sensor continuous glucose monitoring device, um, those may not be accurate also in low, um, so definitely ask patient to confirm by finger sticks before treating, especially if their um, sensor is alarming low, but they don't have symptoms. Risk factors for low blood sugars would be increased risk um, in patients who aim for very tight glucose control, patients who are on insulin or sulfonylurea, patients who are elderly with poor nutrition, who have liver, kidney disease, uh, women who um, start periods because they're um, usually women are insulin resistant before the period, but as the period starts, insulin resistant resolves and insulin requirements drop dramatically and a patient may have severe hypoglycemia. Um, undiagnosed hypothyroidism and adrenal insufficiency. Um, so keep in mind that hypoglycemia um, differential diagnosis um, goes between um, patient who has diabetes and patients uh, who don't have diabetes and just have postprandial hyper hypoglycemia. So if patient has postprandial hypoglycemia, it could be various um, metabolism of glucose abnormalities. In patients who have diabetes, usually it's either excessive insulin or <clears throat> sulfonylureas or excess exercise and not adjusting insulin for it, um, decreased in the calorie intake patients who are not able to feel this and recognize symptoms of hypoglycemia, which is hypoglycemia awareness, autonomic neuropathy with, especially with either gastroparesis or dumping of the uh, food. For fasting hypoglycemia divided between ill appearing patients and healthy appearing patients. For ill appearing patients in the hospital, those patients would be extremely unlikely to have insulinoma. It would be either sepsis or kidney liver failure, congestive heart failure, endocrine deficiencies, as we talked, 
alcohol, plus malnutrition, plus different medications. For healthy appearing patients, insulinoma, one of the causes, um, patients actually look good, they gain weight because they're constantly snacking to keep their blood sugars up and other conditions. Um, so hypoglycemia is severely defined by symptoms more than the absolute blood glucose level, or again, as I mentioned, blood glucose level that less than 54 milligram per deciliter. Mild hypoglycemia is when patients are able to self-treat. They may have symptoms, sweats of tremors, anxiety, irritability, hunger, and difficulty concentrated. The definition for severe hypoglycemia is when patients are not able to self-treat and require third-party assistance. They get confused, lethargic, can develop seizures or coma. Treatment, um, if glucose is 50 to 70, 15-15 uh, rule. Um, so consume 15 grams of fasting glucose. Do not eat. Um, just wait till the blood sugars come up. And if the level is less than 50, then um, consume 20 to 30 grams of fast-acting carbs. Retest in 15 minutes and repeat if needed. Um, so those are the examples of the fast-acting carbohydrates. Uh, glucose tablet three to four. So depending on which glucose tablets you use, we have um, here now glucose tablets changed from five grams to four grams of glucose. So because of that, four glucose tablets would need to be used. Fruit juice, um, about four ounces will have 15 grams. Regular soft drinks, four to six ounces, not the whole can of the regular Coke. Lifesavers, eight to 10. Raisins, about two tablespoons. Uh, sugar or jelly, um, about two tablespoons. Um, so sometimes patients use Gatorade, which is good source, but remembering that this G2 Gatorade has barely any sugar, so only two grams, so it would be too, um, too much to drink to get that amount of sugar. Um, so, and Gatorade has the regular Gatorade about 6% of the dextrose per 100 uh, milligram, per 100 ml. Um, so uh, drink us that are juicy, uh, that, uh, that have over 8%, uh, percent, maybe too much. So for juice, um, it has 11% of the glucose. That's why it's important not to overdo it and drink only about four ounces. Power Aid has about 8% of glucose. And um, also remembering that hypoglycemia actually increases the rate of emptying. So I recommend my patients to use the chewable source of glucose because we have a lot of blood vessels in the mouth and glucose gets absorbed faster. And also like mentally patient feels more of the sweet taste and chewing the glucose than gulping the juice or the soda. And um, again, stomach empties faster, waiting for the lower part of the intestine to absorb that glucose may take a little longer. Um, so chewable glucose is a great source and easier to carry with the patients. And I'm grateful for your um, being here today and thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to answer questions. I think we have a few minutes left. And I'm gonna stop share my slides. I think there is one question in the chat. Um, and recorded version, okay. Yeah, I'm happy to um, also share my slides if needed, uh, but they were recorded as well. All right, well, while someone is thinking of some questions, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Rufina, for giving us your time today. I think this is a very important topic and the management is always a little tricky. So um, having your guidelines and um, explanations on how to approach these patients and take care of them is really important. So thank you very much. Uh, anyone, Cameron, feel free with questions. Have a few more minutes.
Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Dr. Tintino. So I didn't uh, quite understand when uh, she mentioned when she mentioned uh, nitric oxide dysfunction when she was trying to explain uh, the immunologic changes that we may see with DKA. She mentioned increased interleukin one, TNF alpha, interleukin six. I didn't quite pick the nitric oxide dysfunction that was mentioned. Um, so normally the nitric oxide oxide will um, improve the uh, the like vasculature or uh, normal tone and vasodilation of the blood vessels. Uh, so when there is uh, and sort of imagine that severe hyperglycemia, it's like a cytokine storm sort of um, because of the body as uh, inflammatory because it's precipitate the inflammatory state. Uh, with the cytokines, there is a suppression of the nitric oxide, oxide um, and that leads to dysfunction of the endothelial cell um, of the blood vessels. Yeah, thank you. So that was actually where my confusion came from because I understand that uh, interleukin one um, causes increased uh, secretion of nitric oxide by the endothelial cells. Yeah, of course. Um, so, so that was where I got mixed up in. So, if uh, you are explaining that, it will instead be low. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I can also see a question in the chat. Um, how uh, can we differentiate between DKA and alcoholic ketosis um, when blood glucose little? Um, on a higher side, oh, um, like 250. Um, so yeah, that's a great question because uh, both can have um, elevated anion gap um, and both um, can have, if the patient has this, uh, as we said, normal glycemia, um, normal glycemic or euglycemic DKA. Um, so uh, we can check the alcohol level. Um, so usually if it's in ATOH DKA, the alcohol level will be high in the blood. So that will allow us to, that would be the main distinction factor. Uh, what type of the, um, uh, keto, of the ketoacidosis we're dealing with. And by, um, if so, if uh, it, the alcohol level is elevated, then we can uh, more suspect of the E2H related um, ketoacidosis than, um, than the DKA. Hello. Um, Dr. Vasina, thank you very much for what we felt was a great uh, presentation on this very relevant topic. We, we do see some of these patients here, yeah, maybe once, once every two months. And, and thanks for sharing your, your experience with us. I think we have some couple of more questions here. Now, in your experience, um, sometimes you mentioned about uh, insulin infusions, the insulin infusion pumps in the management of DKA. Uh, in some in some of our in some of our centers, we we don't have access to those uh, uh, devices. So, what about uh, using intramuscular or subcutaneous hourly or even two hourly um, regular insulin infusion? How about how about that? And what's your experience with that? And the yeah. the other question is yes, the other question is. Uh, with the issue of uh, hypernatremia, as we are, we are we are starting, we are beginning with the IV fluid resuscitation for this patient. Again, um, the the, avail the availability of 0.45 percent saline is very very scarce, if not not available at all. So, what would be your best choice um, in such patients? Who certainly will develop maybe hypernatremia in the context of uh, IV free resuscitation. 
Um, yeah, great questions. Um, so to answer the first question, uh, which is a really good one, how uh, can we manage with uh, sub-Q insulin? Um, so absolutely, we can. It's just more a little bit more difficult because of the timing of the absorption and because of the, it also will depend on the degree of the dehydration of the patient. But yes, we can definitely manage with sub insulin. And they are actually American Diabetes Association protocols um, how to manage um, with sub insulin. So sub insulin recommendations are to give every two hours. I, I know you mentioned intramuscular. So insulin for DKA would not be good to give intramuscular because when patients are not moving and lying down in bed, um, the insulin is absorption, absorption of insulin from the muscle is very slow. So if you give insulin into the, let's say, hip muscle and you put patient on a treadmill and patient will run, be start running, so that insulin will get absorbed fast. But if you are a patient lying in bed and not feeling well, that intramuscular insulin infusion will take quite a long time to get absorbed. So subcutaneous insulin injections definitely um, would work. Um, you would need to do it every two hours. Um, the difficulty with that is not to uh, to give enough and not to overdo it. So there are protocols um, published uh, with the use of sub-Q insulin when you don't have IV insulin available. And those can be used with for monitoring and um, treating the DKA. So, but yeah, so basically monitor, do frequent monitoring. You use... Um, sub Q every two hours. And we've been using that sometime also in the hospital, let's say if patients are on the floors where uh, we are not able to give IV insulin because not on every floor we're able to administer intravenous insulin. And for example, the hospital is so full that we're not able to send patient to ICU. So sometimes we do that as well. Um, so because you are doing every two hours, you would... Um, just need to remember that insulin half-life is four to six hours, usually four hours to consider uh, the half-life for those acute conditions. So when you're giving your insulin sub-Q every two hours, you would just remember that approximately half of the previous insulin dose is still present. So when you calculate, uh, for example, if you need, if you calculate that this time you need to give eight units, um, and two hours ago, you gave, um, you still have four units remaining from the previous, and you gave already, let's say, eight units two hours prior, so you still have four units remaining in the body, uh, because it's been only two hours since the last uh, in, um, injection or last um, medication, so it is important to reduce that eight units, your current dose. So it give only four units and then recalculate again in, uh, in, um, in another two hours. Um, hydration is very important. <clears throat> so you will continue intravenous fluid. Uh, to answer your um, another question with if um, half normal saline is not available, um, that is a very good question. I don't know if you can prepare yourself the half normal if you have saline bags and asking the pharmacy to sort of dilute um, your saline uh, to be able with sterile water to be able to get to a half normal solution to calculate how much you need to add. Um, I don't know if you have a lactate ringer solution or any other solution to be used, but I would probably try to sort of self recreate um, half normal. If you're not um, able to get it through, through the pharmacy, just calculate how much water you need to infuse to saline solution to make it half normal. Yes, um, we, we do sure have access that, yeah. to lactate ringers. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have uh, lactate ringers here available. Yeah, so, so you that would be an, an alternative. alternative. That so you would need to monitor sodium very very uh, carefully because it also has, you know, the electrolytes um, for LR uh, solution. So I would do definitely more. So usually we say every two hours. I might need to do every one to two hours of electrolytes monitoring for those patients. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah, of course. 
Please, there, there's another question here, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, doctor. So since it, uh, still uh, in the line of IV fluid resuscitation for these patients, let's take an example. You have a patient who is uh, not hypotensive, coming in, maybe just tachycardic and very dehydrated. Now, given that uh, on entry, we will not have the serum sodium for these patients. And we know that IV isotonic fluid resuscitation is like the mainstay of treatment upfront for this patient. So um, I don't know, how do you do in that context? They are coming in, you don't know their sodium. How safe is it with the boluses that we usually just give, given that it may worsen, if maybe say the patient has hypernatremia coming in already, bolusing with a fluid like ringers or normal saline can further worsen their hypernatremia. I don't know what uh, you think about that. Sorry, I must. Um, I might have missed the beginning. So, um, are you asking if you don't have the electrolyte uh, blood test available? Yes, given that yes, in most cases, patients coming in, you will not have their lab values. So you may. I see. Uh, you may need to run yeah. one before. So. Mm -hmm. So you would just give normal saline if you don't have electrolyte because patients are so severely dehydrated. So even before you get any of your lab results, you would still give a bolus uh, because there, you, um, again, as, um, remember we mentioned that the, at least the, a fluid deficit would be three to five liters. Um, so you're uh, free to give a, at least a liter bolus of normal saline before even you get to electrolytes. So that is totally safe. And regardless of what the sodium level is, because they're so dehydrated and so hyperglycemic. So um, if you don't have potassium, um, so it depends on, um, you know, patients um, comorbid conditions, if patients is has very high risk for heart disease or prior history of arrhythmias, um, then you may want to just hydrate first before you get your potassium level um, and then decide on the insulin administration. So there's no rush to give the insulin if you're hydrating the patient. Um, and so you would you may want want to wait for electrolytes, but if you are um, not sure when you are going to have the electrolytes, you can give more slowly insulin infusion. Uh, don't give bolus of the insulin intravenously. Just start with the infusion um, to make sure that um, you know your potassium to or to wait for potassium to get to come back first. Thank you just be more gentle. But a lot of the times, honestly, we do manage uh, DK even as an outpatient. We have a lot of patient calls um, that especially in during the winter time when patients are sick with different um, you know, viral infections. And um, you know that those patients are likely to be in DK the way they're describing it and the way their blood sugars. And they also tell you that either they have the blood glucose, the, uh, the blood ketone meter, or they have a ketone strips, urine ketone strips at home. Um, so when they're measuring, they tell you that they have three plus ketones. So one thing we usually ask patients, are you able to keep fluids down? So if you are able to keep fluids down, you can pretty much try to manage your DKA at home. Unless they are not uh, have nausea and vomiting and not able to keep anything down, that would be the time they need to rush to the hospital. But if not, a lot of the times we would just manage a DKA or mild DKA as an outpatient by sort of guiding the patient, drink more fluids and uh, take more insulin. So we don't necessarily have, we don't have electrolytes to manage and we just um, usually do it, especially if it's a younger and more healthy patients, we always do that. Okay, thank you for answering those couple questions, Dr. Bissina. I wanna make sure that um, in, we are respectful of your time. Um, but there are, there was just one more question in the chat. Uh, uh, that as we do not have alcohol level measurement, do we also give insulin for AKAs? Um, yeah, so 
if you are um, suspecting alcoholic ketoacidosis. So it's important to um, not just to give IV and, and, um, and uh, IV and uh, fluids, but it's important to um, give actually. So depending on the glucose level. So like you said, if glucose is less than 250, so you would add dextrose and you would also add thiamine and all the alcohol sort of cocktail uh, to prevent Wernicke's encephalopathy on tap. So if you have any slight suspicion for that, um, you can feel, you can smell the alcohol breath. Um, even if you don't have the alcohol level, I would treat as alcoholic uh, DKA or, or alcoholic ketoacidosis just to be safe. So I would uh, give the whole, what we call those yellow bag with the vitamins and um, give some dextrose and insulin if needed, if blood sugar are elevated. Um, and I would treat as alcoholic ketoacidosis. Yeah, you're right. If, especially if patient has prior history of, um, um, if patient has prior history of like say type one diabetes, for example. The one important thing to remember with the alcoholic and um, diabetes, if patients, let's say you're treating this patient, patient becomes hypoglycemic. Um, giving um, glucagon is not going to help because the product of the breakdown of the alcohol interfere with gluconeogenesis. So it's important to remember that for those patients, you need to give glucose. Um, it's the same thing as we usually counsel our type 1 diabetes students or um, when they party, if they get uh, nauseated and vomiting in the morning, um, that glucagon injection, if they have type 1 diabetes, glucagon injection may not help with low blood glucose. So it's important to give um the glucose in order to uh, raise the glucose level because glucagon would not be effective. I think uh, we're way past time, Marina, so we're going to be uh, really respectful of your time, but I'm so glad that everyone got to uh, sort of got their questions answered and thank you thank you thank you very much for sort of patiently uh, answering as always you uh, glad we had you back by popular demand so uh, uh, it was well worth uh, everyone's time I think thank, thank you, you very, very much. much and have a wonderful day everyone thank you thank you, and thank you all from uh, Cameroon folks and then I see Tanzania India Nepal Mexico some of the uh, colleagues from there uh, here. So thank you all for taking our time for joining us. Thanks, Bernadette. Thank you. Bye.